Hi, I'm Vashi Nedimansky, and I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join me for my session. It's going to be really exciting. Today, I'm going to discuss the entire post-production of a feature film. And by the end of it, you'll see 10 components of how we do it and give you some tips on how you can apply this to any of your workflows for any project that you tackle. Enjoy. We're going to use the feature film Six Below, which I edited and at the same time documented the entire process from ingesting the footage to making the final deliverables that went out to the world. I'm really proud to share this with all of you because this is not a hypothetical situation. This is an actual feature film that I was tasked with creating and overseeing the entire post-production pipeline from start to finish. So you know what to expect. Here's a breakdown of all 10 chapters. So with that said, let's dive in. I just want to share the information that works for me and let you implement it into your own workflows. Chapter one, hardware and software. On six below, we faced a huge technical challenge right out of the gate. We shot the film at 6K with Red Dragon cameras and we performed the entire post-production using the raw 6K R3D red files. I've always believed in front-loading your post-production system and getting the best equipment that your budget allows. That investment up front gave us real-time editing during post-production and saved a lot of time downstream during rendering and exports. And because we were editing the 6K raw red files, we never had to do a conform at the end and swap out proxies with the original camera footage. We even did all the VFX in 6K. Here's the complete breakdown of the workstation that I used to cut the first native 6K feature film in Hollywood history. I'll leave this image up as I talk you through why we chose these components. My post-production supervisor, Mike McCarthy and myself, tested out every system and every platform out there to try and get real-time playback of these 6K red raw files. And this specific combination was the only workstation that could play everything back in real time. We chose Adobe Premiere Pro as the editing platform because it could handle natively 6K files and in concert with the NVIDIA GPU, we can get accelerated GPU playback and effects on the fly with no rendering. On top of that, we had direct access to After Effects via dynamic linking from Premiere Pro so I could send my 6K shots to the VFX editors and let them work in After Effects and then they could return a 6K completed file right back into my timeline. And I always prescribe to try and get the best system you can so you can have the best results and the best performance because, you know, post-production is a marathon, not a sprint, and you want to have a good time while you're doing it. Before the editing starts and the creative process starts, you have to make sure that you have an optimized system with all the proper settings prepared before you even begin. If I'm going to drive from Los Angeles to Detroit, the first thing I do is I check the gas in my car, I check the oil, check the tire pressure, the coolant, I adjust my seats and the mirrors, set the temperature so it's nice and cool, and then, and only then, do I start my journey. So before I edit my first frame, I make sure everything is dialed in and ready to go. The goal is to make the machinery become invisible, and I can focus solely on the storytelling process. Under the Audio tab, make sure that Automatic Audio Waveform Generation is turned on. This will create waveforms when you first ingest any media and it will live inside the project forever. So you can zoom in, you can zoom out, even while you're playing, and the waveforms will always be there and they never have to be redrawn. The Media tab is one of the most important within Premiere Pro. Under Default Media Scaling, make sure it is set to frame size this will ensure that if you shoot at 4K, 6K, or 8K and put it into an HD timeline, you still have access to every pixel from the original footage. The next option is Snap Playhead in Timeline when Snap is enabled. It has to be activated here in the Preferences and also in the Timeline, which we'll show you later, if you want to have the Snap functionality where you can grab a clip, move it around, and it'll always adhere to the closest clip or next edit point. Under the General tab, I make sure that the renderer is pointing towards my Mercury Playback Engine GPU acceleration so I can harness the power of my NVIDIA card that I have in my system. 
Now that we've set up all our preferences and optimized our system, the first thing that we have to do, and it's extremely important, is to organize our project, create a bin structure to hold all our footage, import all our assets in the best possible way so we preserve all the metadata and maintain access to all the additional information that's attached to these files, and then sync the audio to the picture because on most feature films, the audio, any dialogue, any sound is recorded separately. So we have to merge or sync the video with the highest quality sound files before we start editing. There's a tendency to want to start editing right away, but it's critical to organize your footage and become familiar with your footage before you start editing the first frame. On Six Below, we had over 100 hours of footage and we were collaborating between five people, so I kept it to seven simple folders that are numbered so you can easily see where they live and more importantly, where to add new assets to the project as you keep moving forward. Now, when it comes to importing footage the right way, and if there's one takeaway from this entire chapter, it is use the media browser to import any assets. This will guarantee that any kind of spanned footage, any kind of red files where you only want the video file, any kind of audio, this will guarantee that it comes in cleanly with all the metadata and will give you access to the latest codecs and you won't have any compatibility issues and you won't have any problems with footage being imported that doesn't play use the media browser. It's basically a finder within Premiere Pro. So here I drill down to my external hard drive, find the folder that I want. Then I hit the tilde key, which is the top left of the keyboard underneath the escape key. This lets me see the actual footage within the folder and I can scroll through it to make sure it's exactly the clip that I want. I hit right click and then I choose import to bring that clip into my project. In this chapter, I want to go over the basics of film editing, how we actually get our assets from our bins or the source monitor into our timeline. Now, film editing is a combination of both technical and creative skills. At the end of the day, it's storytelling. Now, the mechanical method of editing is the same for a 30 second spot or a music video or a commercial or even a feature film. I use the same approach for a short form program as I do for a feature film. You may find it surprising, but 95% of the things I do every day consist of seven mechanical acts. These functions include mark in, mark out, insert, overwrite, lift, extract, and trim. That's it. With these seven editing options, I can take any amount of footage, dialogue, music, and sound effects and turn it into a cohesive and coherent piece. Lastly, before I start editing, I think about the entire project and I break it down into these six components, which will help me and help you break down hundreds of hours of footage and make it more manageable and give you realistic goals to hit every day, all day long. Shot, moment, scene, sequence, reel, film. Print this out, keep it handy. It's always worked for me and I know it'll work for you. This could be my favorite chapter because I get to share with you my editorial style that I developed over 10 years ago that we used on Gone Girl and Deadpool and Terminator Dark Fate and obviously Six Below, which I'll be showing you today. I actually coined the term pancake timeline almost 10 years ago and 99% of the tutorials out there are showing you the wrong way to do it. So since I coined the term, let me show you the proper way to use the pancake timeline. I go back to the sequences, I'll right click. I'll right click and open this in the source monitor. Now it's in the source monitor as a sequence, but I can't see it. I can scroll through, I have access to all the footage, but I can't see the, the actual timeline. So I'll, using the wrench, I'll open the wrench and then I'll say open sequence and timeline. And once again, I can set this all to keyboard shortcuts so it goes quicker. Now when I open the sequence in the timeline, you'll see there's a red timeline indicator and the footage is being shown in my source monitor. This should be very familiar to source and program in Avid where you have one side active and the other side is your output. Now when I take the, the sequence I'm cutting into and drag it underneath again, that output will be played in my output program monitor. So now I have access to both 
all the footage in my source monitor and my output in the program monitor. And here's where the real magic happens. Now in my source monitor timeline that I have access to, if I hit in and out, wherever that may be, once I hit insert, it puts it below into my active project. And that way I can take whatever I want, have access to over 20 hours of footage in this scenario, and anything I wanna grab in, out, insert, will be put down below into my master timeline that I'm working and cutting into. I use this button at the top left of every sequence to choose between inserting nested or individual clips from the source monitor. Audio and mixing are the glue that hold together any project, and I'll often spend more time on audio than I will on video. On a feature film like Six Below, I'll often build out to over 30 individual tracks to hold all the audio and tell the story. Audio has to fill out the sonic world and sometimes disappear and sometimes be very prevalent and stay out of the way of the dialogue and just live together in harmony so the viewer can really take that cinematic journey. Audio is a dance between the dynamic, the loud, and the quiet parts that help the viewer understand the world and really get transported into the story. The bottom line is that great audio will separate the professional from the amateur. If I'm in the timeline here, and if I want to rubber band something, then all I have to do is hit is hold the control button and you'll see the little plus sign that comes next to the cursor. That's now it's off. If it's off, you're just seeing the levels and you can go up and down, drag it as you would normally would and you'll see how it changes. But if I wanted to create rubber band keyframes and I hit the control and I add them as needed. And then once I've drawn them, I can grab them obviously and manipulate them however I want, up or down. The cool part with this is that if I bounce out of this, these keyframes, if I double click, will be shown in my effects panel as well. So you can see here that I have all my keyframes that represent and match this. If I grab all of these and I wanna slide the entire pattern as I've marked it earlier, if I slide to the left, you'll see in the timeline that they follow. So I can move keyframes on mass. I don't have to rewrite everything or, or grab only one at a time. I can go to the effects panel, open up the volume effect, and then lasso them and move them around to get a little easier manipulation of those keyframes. A really, really cool feature that I use all the time. And anyone who's who wants to really dig in with dialogue and, and effects, you know how hard it is to Frankenstein words, especially if you don't have that space between the frames where you're cutting off one, one frame and you're doing dissolves across the gap and keyframing those. Right now we're in normal 24 frames per second mode. But if you go to the actual sequence that you're working on and you come down underneath this hamburger menu, if, if you choose show audio time units, you all of a sudden jump into 48,000 samples per second. Meaning I was zoomed in as far as I could be before. Now if I zoom in, I'm going to the absolute smallest unit of time for this specific clip. I can go in even further, it gets ridiculous. Kind of so I can actually cut off S's or build words from scratch by just making edit points at the subframe level. And then if I just cut this out, I'm gonna cut it out and it's less than a frame. When I go back to frame mode, if I turn off show audio time units, I'm now within, I'm back to frame mode. You can see that that chunk I took out is less than a frame. And so being able to cut at a subframe level and then recreate those words or manipulate the dialogue or the effects, it's a really powerful tool to be able to go in there. Color correction is a really important part of the process, and more and more today, it falls upon the editor to do a lot of this color correction. Now, I wanna distinguish between color correction and color grading, because every film will need both. As the film editor, the color correction I do is basically balancing the shots, and especially shots that stand out that have a different color temperature, or just look out of whack, and it'll take the viewer out of the moment. So the first thing that I wanna do when preparing for this is to set up my workspace. 
built into Premiere, I use the color workspace, which gives me the tools like Lumetri panel and the Lumetri scopes and sets up my timeline in a way that I can interact with the footage and see everything properly. For proper balancing and assessment of colors, I'll set up both the vector scope YUV and the waveforms in RGB. The waveforms start at the bottom here. Zero is pure black and 100 at the top is pure white. Everything that falls in between is a mixture of red, green, and blue and the luminance, and it's represented here, and it matches whatever is on my output monitor. These are linked and give you direct feedback. The vector scope on the right shows the distribution and saturation of all the colors. These two scopes give me the real-time feedback I need to play back my edit and make sure everything looks correct. When I select any clip in the timeline, it'll activate the Lumetri color panel, which gives me access to all the individual sliders and tools I need. There's actually six different windows within that panel, but I prefer to use just the Lumetri basic corrections panel to do most of my work. If you use Lightroom or Photoshop, it should look very familiar. On 6 Below, we were using the 6K red RAW files, so it was important to have real-time playback between the Lumetri panel and the Lumetri scopes. Definitely the powerful Dell Precision Workstation and my NVIDIA Quattro GPU kept everything in real-time even though we were dealing with a massive amount of information. Always trust your scopes as they are a accurate representation of the values of both color and luminance. And you can see here that my starting point to where I am now took me about 30 seconds, but makes a huge difference and is repeatable for all other shots. For more complicated projects, my friend and fellow filmmaker Stu Mashowitz made this order of operations list, which tells you exactly which step to do in the process of color correction and color grading. Definitely print this out and keep it close by. Visual effects are another important component of filmmaking, and as we learned with audio, it falls more and more upon the film editor to do a lot of these visual effects. Now, we may not be able to do the final version, it may be passed on to another teammate, but our job as an editor is to provide something that helps tell a story, is convincing, and could pass for the final effect. And I did create several, like this one, for Six Below that was the final effect, and I'll show you how we did that in this chapter. For this example from Six Below, instead of two characters in one frame, I'm gonna be using the same shot and splitting the top and bottom of the frame and create a little visual effect right within it. Under the effects panel, I'll choose the opacity of the clip and that's the bottom here. I'm gonna use four clips in a row to give it the right length. And I'm gonna use the free draw Bezier tool under opacity to directly on the image itself, choose what I wanna carve out. So I'll begin by drawing this diagonal line across the frame so I can keep the bottom half of the image at regular speed. And then what I'm gonna do is speed up the top half of the image and make that six times as fast so it looks like the skies are moving and the world is moving a lot quicker. I'm gonna invert the mask so I just see Josh at the bottom and I'm gonna be able to use that mask and then copy and paste it to the other three clips that follow. Now, these clips are also running in reverse. The second and fourth clip are running in reverse, so I can stretch that entire moment out and have four times the length based on one clip. Because he's far away and he's not really moving, it'll still appear very natural as everything is happening in real time and he's just rocking back and forth. The last thing I do is to set my mask feather so the edge of the mask blends easily into the other image that will be above it. Um, I can go as far as I want, but I find around 100 to be suitable for this shot so it blends together with the top half of the frame and there's no discernible line between the two shots. I have a duplicate of the clip right above my masked version, so I'm going to right click on that and change the speed so it speeds up. Right now it's 100% for 10 seconds, let's make that 600, so it's about 2 seconds long now and it's really short in the timeline. Now I have to copy and drag this clip over and over to cover the masked shots. I use Alt drag and I can quickly duplicate two at a time, then four at a time and cover the entire expanse of the shot with all the masked shots underneath it. So just Alt drag, keep going. So you make the two second shot 12 seconds long, cut off the end so they're both the same length. So we can now play it back and see what it looks like at six times speed. 
you'll notice that Josh is also moving at six times speed. So we're going to make one more adjustment before we have our final shot. We're going to grab the four shots that are masked, drag them above the fast footage. And now our mask will show us that the real time speed will be at the bottom and the six times sped up speed will be at the top of the image. They're living together. This is happening in real time. I don't have to render this and I have a really cool visual effect done very quickly and very easily. In this chapter, I'd like to discuss some of the techniques and workflow that we used so we could create visual effects for Six Below. And we found out that in After Effects, we had more power, more control, and a more flexible way to approach the workflow so that multiple team members could work on shots and not disturb the workflow of the editor. That's me. And since we had to produce 6K VFX final shots, we had to be very careful and very specific on how we approached it. The first step is to go into your timeline and alt drag or copy the video of the clip that you're going to apply an effect to and put it on a higher track in the timeline so we can always have access to the original clip. Then you right click and replace with After Effects Composition which will open up that new individual file in After Effects so we can harness the power of After Effects and do a lot of creative and intricate work. This is called creating a dynamic link. And now we're looking at that shot inside After Effects where it's ready to be worked on. And what's great is the VFX artist or your assistant can work on it in a different room while you're working on the main Premiere Pro project in the original timeline. By converting that video clip into an After Effects project, anyone outside of your edit bay can work on that clip and the work will be updated within Premiere Pro once they save it on their end. To give you a quick example, I'm going to grab the bulge effect in After Effects, put it on my clip and focus it on Josh's face, then bump up the radius so it's clear and visible that I'm adding an effect and it's quite outrageous, but I want it to be clear that you can see the effect before you take on this workflow. And it's important because it's the core of the workflow. You could have 20 or 30 different compositions open in After Effects live while you're in Premiere Pro as well. So now if we click back to Premiere Pro, it will automatically update that top clip, which is an After Effects project. And you can see in real time that there's a dynamic link between After Effects and Premiere Pro. And since I have a copy of that clip, it's non-destructive and I never have to worry about having that original clip available to me. Now that our film is locked and we're not gonna make any more changes, we begin the last critical stages of post-production which includes creating the master file. From this file, we can generate all the deliverables for distribution, theatrical markets, and web delivery of our final film. For Six Below, we had to actually deliver 14 different deliverables. That includes the Blu-ray version, the standard definition version, the different aspect ratio versions, the TV version, the web online version, and the Barco Escape version, and there's a couple more as well. During editorial, the film is crafted into a complex tapestry of video clips, effects, transitions, music, sound, dialogue, and graphics. Once this painstaking process is done, months of work get compressed into one file. This is the master file, also known sometimes as the Texas Master. This master file is created at the highest resolution possible with the highest output audio, usually a 5.1 or 7.1 audio mix, and with the least amount of compression possible. We will often use ProRes 422HQ or ProRes 4444 or Cineform to create that master file at the highest resolution. One thing to note, in our Windows workflow, we found the Cineform codec to encode a lot faster than ProRes given any source file that we started with. Always ask the people or the company that you're delivering the film to for a spec sheet so you can match exactly what they require and you'll pass QC, quality control, and not have the film bounced back and force you to create another deliverable. Well, that's it, you made it. That's the 10 components of the feature film and how we do it in Hollywood. Um, thank you so much again for joining me for the entire session. And if you'd like, there is a 69 page PDF that goes into much greater detail on my entire process. You can download it for free right here, one of the two places. Thanks again, enjoy Adobe Max, and we'll see you soon, bye.